Let's do it. Hey, everybody. We're here with the great John Stepling again. Um, and we may be joined uh, additionally by a third, uh, another guest. Uh, he's running into some technical difficulties, so that may or may not transpire. But regardless, uh, the last time we started was the sort of vague intention of discussing the theatrical, the theater, its connection with other categories like silence and religion. But we kind of got drawn off of that point of departure, talk about other things. It was fantastic, but I felt badly because theater was what you really wanted to discuss. And so today, you know, I thought, let's come back to that, at least as our initial point of focus and really elaborate on your thoughts on the theater and the theatrical um, and perhaps even its relationship. You know, you can like, I was looking at an essay of yours, Accountable in the Dumpster, right? And a few things come out in that essay. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there about the cave paintings, uh, uh, scowl and so forth. But also you touch at various moments upon a kind of tension between what's going on with the screen, like even if you're watching you know, a film or something, right? Uh, or a television program, there's a distinction between that engagement, the engagement of, the, of a screen and the engagement of the theater, right? The theater is intimately connected to space and to place in a concrete way, which doesn't occur with the screen. And right. that that might be that might be more concretely a point of departure if you want to just sort of riff sure. on that tension. Well, I I um I began in in theater. Uh, I, I I didn't go to college or university. Uh, I I barely got out of high school, but I wandered into New York City uh, in 1970 71. Um, my cousin Jim Storm was in a play of Sam Shepard's The Genesis, and that. That was my introduction in a certain sense to contemporary theater. And it was an extraordinary period off off Broadway in New York at that time. The government beginning with Mayor Lindsay had thrown money at the arts. Everybody, everybody had signed up as an artist and was getting money of some sort. And, and the arts were flourishing and in theater in particular, there was Theater Genesis and La Mama and Judson's, and a ton of places. Artists like Mednick and Shepard and Irene Fornes and Ronnie Tavell and Jean Claude Van Atali and uh, uh, Richard Foreman and just countless countless minor and major people that were terrific actors working. And it was, a, it was that was my, it was, a, it was a quite extraordinary thing to be thrown into this environment. Now I preface this discussion with, with that little historical frame. And, and let me plug uh, a book called Outlaw Theater that was published, the field notes from the Padua Hills Festival. Uh, Guy Zimmerman edited it, and uh, 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 I have an essay in there. Martin Epstein has an essay in there, and I talk about Padua. So I encourage people to read that because I think it's very interesting. And I I try to put Padua and what happened in California, West Coast theater in the seventies and eighties, which was a in some sense, a postscript to off off Broadway. Anyway, uh, in many ways, Mednick, Murray Mednick, was hugely influential for me uh, in, in terms of theater. I, I also, Terry Ork was there in the arts, uh, now best known as the manager of the band television. Uh, 
uh, at the time, but but he was an erudite kind of brilliant guy, and he was my other mentor. But but the point here is we're talking about theater. At that time, people had conversations about the arts, at least in big cities in, in this, the end of this modernist trajectory and heated debates about also cinema, not just theater and literature and painting, but, but film, John, there were film sorry. clubs. And, sorry to interrupt, and, John. Yeah. Uh, it looks like Brett is about to join us. So hold on one second. Yep. Sorry. No, that gives me a time to put some snooze in. I'm an advocate for tobacco. <laughs> so. yeah, should be with us. It's waiting for his audio to connect, I think. At least that's what, what the device is telling me. Do, 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 do. Oh, there he is. Oh, uh, there we are. He's got his pipe. Ready to rock. Brett, Brett, I'm so, I'm because I was just smoking. Uh, Look at that. Right. This is like, oh, man, I need to get out of there here. There are very few of us left. Um, that It's very hard in Norway to get pipe tobacco. As a matter of fact. Fortunately, I don't have a cigar on hand here. So. Yeah. I've, I've become, I've become poor smoking, I'm pro smoking. I'm well, smoking. let me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. Um, no, I, I. Real quick, Brett, we were really just getting underway. In fact, yeah, just John started. Can recap what he was saying. He was just talking a bit about um, his let beginning. Me finish, the, yeah, the, it, it, let me just finish that talk because you didn't, yes. you didn't oh, miss anything, Brett. I was just talking about off off Broadway in New York. The point being that there, there was an educated audience for this stuff at that time. And, and when that group of artists, Mednick and, and um, Sam and different people came to California, started Padua, um, there was an audience there as well that absolutely doesn't exist anymore. I mean, Padua was remarkable if you think that you know, as I recall, three nights every weekend that, that the shows were put on uh, outdoors and a couple hundred people would drive out from LA every single night. There was, no, you know, sometimes more than that for the entire run, for the entire month and a half, whatever it was. That's impossible to imagine today. I mean, absolutely impossible. So that, that was essentially my point. But I don't, I feel like I've talked about this, this stuff endlessly already. And uh, I would rather go back to your original question in a way, which, which is the, the, what is the nature of theater and also juxtapose to, to film. Because as I say, when I was in New York in the seventies, none of us worked. One of us had to work. Um, everybody went to movies. I went to two, three movies a day because there were film clubs and, and cinematheques and um, art houses everywhere. And there were great, there, you know, Antonioni and Fassman. These people were turning out films then. And it was quite exciting. I mean, there, this, is, this is like talking about making buggy whips. This is extinct. This is the past. None of this exists anymore. Nobody, so this is my introduction to this discussion is that nobody talks about the seriousness of art, that art is a serious endeavor. Nobody talks about that anymore in that way, except like maybe us here, you know, the few of us that still use buggy whips. Uh, so, so, to just circle back briefly, Mednick was hugely important to me, influential to me in terms of theater specifically. And, and Murray used to say theater is a form of thinking. And 
he he privileged the text that that the text the spoken word this idea of speaking a memorized text aloud had a ritualistic ceremonial value it was really <clears throat> A, a significant activity and I have by extension, I don't want to sit here and lecture. So you know, feel free to interrupt me when you want. But, but, but that uh, I have come to think that the entire process of rehearsal of memorization, <clears throat> rehearsal, the repetition, the compulsive repetition of scenes and dialogue and blocking and is hugely important because it mirrors something, some archaic primordial fundamental trauma in the human psyche. The, even this gets very Freudian, right? But but all of this has Im importance. If you, if you read. Um, the great no Japanese no theater theorist, the father of no, Ziyama, I guess his name. You read some of his stuff. Um, that 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 sort of deep concern for for this process was was very important. I mean, wound is is hugely significant, and I think that that this is that so let me just this is my final thing i turned over. You people always say one of the one of the chestnuts out there is well theater came out of religion so you always hear this and i think that religion came out of theater i think theater as i define it is the er medium is the is the is the fundamental activity of being human and we can talk more about what I mean by that but theater is 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 about at its origin this awakening that is, is so there's a lot is the you know, is the yeah is the it, 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 like I imagine cave dwelling Cro-Magnon cave painters painting in the dark in places that would make the painting very hard to be viewed. <clears throat> they did this for thousands of years without much changing. They painted over a previous one. But I think at some point, some, it happened multiple times our early ancestors stepped into the light and turned back to look at the cave. And there were other people watching them, their fellow community. And that was the beginning of theater. Uh, Suddenly lot. somebody was on, going on there, right? Now. Somebody was on stage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like as you were talking, all sorts of things that it elicited all sorts of reflections from my person. Um, and one which isn't going to be central, but which I just going to remark when you were discussing the process of rehearsal is the importance of repetition, repetition, repetition. And a lot of times, you know, uh, I think in casual, like the ordinary person's casual thought of theater, that the process of rehearsal is understood as just kind of like an annoyance, a, a pragmatic pertinence, which is a precondition of the ultimate performance but what you're saying is no i mean there is the performance and that is the consummation but it can't happen without the process of rehearsal and uh, that to me also seems like the space where you really arrive at embodiment embodiment and that connects uh, to other domains of human life right <laughs> even um like we annoy right here but uh playing chess right you know like people play chess on the screen but you have to play over the board and i mean i you talk to really consummate right. chess players and uh, <clears throat> they're right. like if you really want to learn something you can't just do it on the screen you got to get the pieces out and you have to go over it and over it and over it 
it's just a point of analogy. And I just wanted to you know point that out before I turn it over to Brett, because um, I could go on obviously. I'm adept at doing that, and right. ask Brett, you know, what are your responses there, or what is like your first or second order response to John's sort of initial comments? Uh, well, um, I, I mean, I agree with John. Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> um, and historically, I, I would think you're right. I mean, not just speaking philosophically, John, uh, about the origins of theater. I mean, it makes sense that, that theater would uh, predate religion. Um, I mean, theater is, in a sense, it's, it's, it's birthed by the social. It's, it's the ultimate pu public art. Um, it is the theater, uh, the state of the theater is the theater of the state. Um, and it's, a, it's an impure art, which is part of what makes it, I think, so special. Um, because it, it's, 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 a, it's a composite art. It's made up of all these heterogeneous elements. Um, and I think just to kind of elaborate what I mean by that is you have a very basic set of, of requirements, I think, for, for theater to be theater and not just the merely performative, for example, you know, because I think a lot of people had this idea that, you know, watching people in a mall can be uh, a kind of theater or, or you know and I, I i don't i don't agree with that the, the merely no. performative is not the theater no um you need first of all a space you know it could be a traditional proscenium stage or, or whatever or a warehouse but you need a space that ritual space john as you've written about and talked about um you need a text of one sort or, or another it doesn't have to be a, a play necessarily text you know, it could be a newspaper, whatever. You need some sort of text right, no. as, as a reference. You need the actors, of course. And you need more than one. You need at least two performers to be theater. Absolutely. Yeah, if this it's is just one, important. it's not theater. No, I no. absolutely agree. And this is something I've said. And this is very important. And let me just let me ask it. this. Why? I and mean, I'm not asking it antagonistically, but because I think it's it's uh, worth elaborating upon why it's the case. Why does one need more than one actor? Yeah, there's a there's a there's an answer to that. But it, and, and but, you need at least one member of an audience. Yeah, this is this is well, but this is also but this you is can't also have an really, empty an empty hall. Yeah, I I've had this discussion uh before putting the audience question aside for a second let's just focus on uh there are great plays with a single character there are but they're very few and they're they're mediated by other factors um thomas bernhardt as i recall has written a couple of single character plays peter honke did uh but 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 they are exceptions that, that prove the rule. Fundamentally, monologists are, this is not theater to me. The theater is, begins with a second character and engaging somehow in a look and a, saying something, and some movement, whatever it is. And the other character observes that there's an interaction. And it's interesting because I, we did a podcast last night and we were talking about early childhood education. Um, and Wittgenstein, somebody, he, a question was posed, could theoretically, hypothetically, somebody have a private language that only they understood? And the answer was finally no, because language is predicated on a social learning. And, and I think this is, um, applies to theater as well. Uh, uh, the, the, 
great, uh, I mean, there's a whole litany of, of great playwrights in the 20th century that we, we arrive at and we can talk ab about Bernhardt and Honky and Janae and Pinter and on and on and on. Heinrich Mueller, and that breath and so forth. So, uh, <clears throat> but, um, you know, in, in the sort of most basic terms, that, that exchange <clears throat> that initiates this performance also begs the question about what is an actor. And I've often asked this question in classes and, um, of actors themselves. What, it is, what do you think you're doing as an actor? What are you doing? What is acting? And this is an important question in a sense, because <clears throat> what you are not doing, it may be very hard to <laughs> define what you're doing, but we, we can talk about what you're not doing as an actor. You are not, and this is true of playwrights as well, director, you are not duplicating reality. The audience sits wherever they sit watching this ritual space, this empty stage that suddenly has two actors on it, two figures in a landscape as it were. And they're perfectly aware they're watching a play. They don't think they're watching real life. And this goes to, to, to Brett's comment about the street. Howard Barker has a great quote about the street. Um, saying much the same thing. This the theater has nothing to do with that. It has absolutely nothing to do with, with reproducing reality. And it, one of the, I remember, I remember talking to a director in Poland when I was there who was staging Shakespeare and I forget the play. And she said to me, well, she wasn't happy with the cast. She said, well, at least I have gotten them to say the lines naturally as if they were just everyday conversation. <laughs> I didn't say anything, but I thought, why would you want to do that? There, it, this is not everyday conversation, it's poetry. It's a, it's a, it's a text for, for putting on stage in a performance. Nobody talks like that. And people say, ah, you know, Pinter has a great ear. Well, yes, but not because people talk like Pinter characters. Pinter characters talk like Pinter characters. Hemingway characters talk like Hemingway characters. Nobody talks that way except Pinter characters or Hemingway characters or whoever. Uh, so, so the actor, this idea, the actor is engaged in this performance and the parameters of what, what might be defined as a performance are very elusive. Um, I mean, Arto certainly had one idea, and and which was wrong in a sense. And so, so let me just put a pin in that for one second, and and say that when I when I began, there were a number of texts on theater that everybody was required to read: *The Empty Space* by Peter Brook, uh, uh, theater. Toward a poor theater, was that it? Grotowski. That's Grotowski. Um, yeah, and and it, it is several others, and and uh, the the um, what's his name, the guy who worked with Shepard and later had a stroke. Oh, fuck, see, I can't remember. Those. Anyway, there there were several several books. When I go back and re, uh, read Joseph Chaikin, Joseph Chaikin, Joe Chaikin, yeah, yeah, okay. it's a great book. It's a great book. Yeah, yeah, and Herbert Blau. Um, Herbert Blau. And, oh, well, Blau was Blau. <laughs> yeah, I want to get to Blau. Um, <laughs> my friend Martin Epstein was a student and friend of Blau. And I did a podcast interview with Martin. He was an old friend. And wrote the Forgotten Master. The Forgotten Master. Yeah, Blau was um, the idea that Blau actually <laughs> um, was, was given positions of some significance in American theater is astounding yeah. when you think about it because he, he was not Lincoln Center yeah yeah he was just not <laughs> suited he was not suited to to this Blau was the, was the last great um, theorist of, of uh, the American stage I think and uh, 
Blau, so, Blau was was hugely influential and and is so John, can I anticipate? Horribly neglected now, I think. Um, my my, I'm going, to, I'm going to anticipate here that yeah. you're going to suggest that there's a conversation being facilitated by these texts that were sort of canonical or to which you were, you know, everyone was reading these texts at the time, but now they've kind of, I'm guessing you're going to say that they sort of fallen into oblivion and what they were saying about <coughs> theater has, has gone by the wayside, meaning in a sense, we've lost the theater. Is that the direction where you were taking? No, at, I, well, what I was going to say that, that, but I was also going to say, if I revisit Peter Brook, let's say, The Empty Space, it's a beautiful book. But I disagree with a great deal of it now when I read it. I think, oh, that's not quite right, you know? Um, and, and to me, there have always been questions about Brooke. He's a, he's a, a titan, I, you, know, I, you know, one doesn't want to uh, question Brooke's significance or stature, but when I go back to that book, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's right, but I think, Certain things he says are absolutely wrong, in fact. But can you give but us the importance? But the importance of that book remains, regardless, right? Because because it was an absolutely serious uh, and and deeply uh, focused and uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Uh, it, it, attempt to to <clears throat> to address the nature of at least modern theater and also of tragedy and this brings so, me to howard howard barker too we'll get to that yeah go ahead how would you and you're, you're gonna have to forgive me because i'm relatively a novitiate in these regards not even a novitiate right so my questions may at times have an amateur quality to them but um <laughs> um I, I think Brett probably has a lot to say already, so I'm going to turn it over to him. Yeah, okay. Uh, in a moment. No, these are incredibly like, rich topics. It you know, goes it, back to the question of, like, for instance, like, what is an actor trying to arrive? The, the, the two sort of root questions are like, what is an actor and why do you need more than one? And when you ask, what is an actor, is it perhaps useful to sort of like look at the accusative of the verb? to perform what is it that the actor is performing it's not the text though the text is integral the text is part of the vehicle of what is being performed i would suggest well i have my suggestions but i'm going to discipline myself and just ask that question two questions well what um, is an actor performing and is that a clue as to why one needs more than one actor to have a real theater. And then I'm going to as a, actually let me do that. Let me ask you that question, Brett. I'm going to ask you that question so that you can sort of jump into the conversation here. And of course, John, you can say as well. And then I should really just like let you guys talk because you're the theater guys. I'm not really a theater guy. So I'm the audience uh, member, as it were. No, so. no, but I think I think it's a really good question. No, go ahead, Brett. I, I please. Well, I mean, my first response, Tom, that you know, you're you're asking, well, why do you need more than one person uh, on the stage or one character? And because you need, well, first of all, theater is always a dialogue. Even a monologue is a kind of dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with the self, with 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 the audience, and theater is 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 a tapestry. It's it's of of voices, and. Uh, uh, so it, it requires more than one figure in, in that, that theaterscape, as I call it. Um, e even if, you know, in Crap's Last Taste, you know, Samuel Beckett's play, yeah, you have one character on stage, but you have, you have the tape recorder, which is a character unto itself, Absolutely. and there's multiple voices coming out of, right. of that, even though you only have one supposed character for most of the play. So. Right. <clears throat> well, um, I think all of that is is true, absolutely true, and and that's a good answer, not the complete answer perhaps, but that's the answer. 
No, I'm, I'm just uh, getting started, John. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure. I, I, um, I need my pipe as my pacifier. Otherwise, I'll just. Yeah, no, not. listen, I, I immediately <laughs> trust you because you smoke the pipe. Um, uh, I, I, I only smoke uh, pipes because it's just too much hassle with, with no smoking. I, I, I wait, smoke wait. when I write, essentially. Yeah, when I'm yeah. writing, I smoke, and I smoke a lot when I yeah. write. Anyway, but what, you, but what are you smoking right now, John? You're smoking something there. Yeah, you, you you brought your pipe up. Yeah, I did. I well, there there's a, a plug that there's a company in Boston, L J. L J. Peretti. L J. Peretti. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, se the uh, second oldest uh, tobacco shop in the U S. Yeah. And I would I would be lost without them, is all yeah. I can say. Um, and and that's what I was smoking. Um, some Virginia flake. I tend to smoke Virginia flake, and um, I've been doing this for 50 years. I have Dunhill pipes made in 1940. You know, I, I was very serious about pipe collecting at one time. I sold a lot of the pipes. Anyway, but back to theater. Um, the the uh, the question of of what actors are doing, they're performing this thing. Well, here's, I'm going to try to answer this, but it will require a slightly circuitous route, big surprise, uh, to, to get to a place where I can answer it. My belief is, and other people have kind of riffed on this now, but I said, I think originally 20 years ago, I came up with this idea that, that the stage is sort of the conscious mind and the offstage is the unconscious. Ergo, the real meaning of, of theater exists offstage. And I always mention, I probably did last time we talked, that at intermission children who come to their first play, high school play or something, run up to look in the wings because they instinctively know something is going on there that didn't happen on the stage. And the Greeks knew this, Shakespeare knew this. So, so if you if you look at tragedy and and Walter Benjamin or Benjamin, if you prefer, uh, wrote about tragedy, the origin of German tragic drama, which is translated different ways these days, but he talks a bit about that the tragedy is a process of revealing something. And it happens in that moment in which the play is taking place and it can only happen in that particular space and it's over when the play ends. Um, there's a great Jan Kott, Shakespeare, our contemporary, the Polish um, theater writer. It's a great book, somewhat forgotten these days. But he talks about King Lear, uh, the Mad Tom scene on the heath. And that's the scene where, you know, Tom is pretending to be somebody else and he's leading the old man up the mountain, except it's not a mountain, it's just the flats stage and then he says oh my goodness i'm getting vertigo we're so high up on the edge of the cliff and <clears throat> gloucester i guess it is says but it feels like nothing i don't feel you know blah, blah. uh and and eventually <laughs> gloucester jumps to his non-death or something now it's a very curious very theatrical scene it's a scene the truth of which could not happen if you filmed it. You, and this is true of Artaud's play, uh, Jet of Blood, also. The last stage directions for Jet of Blood is severed penises rain from the sky, fall from the sky. Well, how do you stage that? Well, you could have roses fall from you know, the rafters. If you filmed it, just like if you film that Shakespeare scene from Lear, there is this, there is this problem of verisimilitude when, when you're filming it. 
So you would get Wes Craven's latex artists, I guess, to make severed penises and have them come down. It wouldn't work. There's no way to do it because Artaud was creating a theatrical truth, as was Shakespeare. That scene, that scene in Shakespeare is a remarkable. I did a, I staged an experimental King Lear when I was in Poland with two actors playing Lear, one speaking Polish, one speaking English. They were on stage together the whole time. The play was done in three languages simultaneously, Norwegian, Polish, and English. It was actually quite good, if I say so myself. But that scene, directing it was quite an experience, I think, because, because I sense uh, uh, this is like Ur theater. This can only happen, right? The truth of this scene, and Jan Kott says this, the truth of that scene is in its performance in time, this temporal, you know, this short duration, this thing that can't be reproduced elsewhere. And, and I think this cuts to the answer of what an actor is doing. An actor is participating in this, this strange ceremony that is both a, a recitation of a memorized text in which this massive amount of repetition is, is embedded, is encapsulated somehow. They are performing the role of themselves in a certain sense in the inescapably so and uh and they are doing something else that it's very hard to define i think but but adorno said this very famous often quoted thing that the radical nature of art lies in its uselessness and in its form not its content not its opinion and this is this is pertinent to theater that that polemical theater to me is almost not theater i'm just not interested it's fine agitprop you know san francisco mind truth whoever it's great fine great do it but it, it's of no real interest to me well isn't it the case that it's almost Go ahead. stuck on it's sort of stuck on the surface right like a merely polemical performance is is, is adhering to a, a very superficial relationship with uh, actuality, right? Mm -hmm. Because a, 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 a radical performance is addressing aspects of your person, of the person that mm -hmm. are more fundamental than the political and i'm using political here in a kind of pejorative derisive sense there's a more dignified manner in which to address that category but which is sort of outside of what you're talking about with uh gadget prop etc so uh, so then the question is like what is that deeper thing which is being addressed um, and i'm going to go back a little bit a few conversation a few conversational paragraphs because Brett had noted that he was just getting going talking about the dialogical nature of the theater then he put his pacifier in his mouth <laughs> uh, say I'm giving you permission but you have permission to put your pacifier to the side for the moment do you want to uh, go on from there or elaborate upon anything which John has said what well, uh Sure. I mean, I'm enjoying listening to John, but um, yeah, I would just, I guess one of the other things I would like to say um, about the theater is to me, theater is fundamentally a, a, an embodied form of poetry. Okay. So you, it requires the voice uh, and the body uh, present uh, in the moment, uh, embodying language um through time and space and uh, uh let me um no, no, it, it, sorry well i i, I watched my train of thought there 
It's okay. I I, <laughs> I lose my train of thought all the time. Um, let me read you a quote. I was when I was waiting to begin this. I was looking at Howard Barker has a book yeah. of um, theater writings called Death, the One, and the Art of Theater. Yeah. Um, so let me read you this quote: The general condition of mankind, fear, in tragedy the relegation of fear to the perimeters, hence the origin of the resentment induced by tragic characters <clears throat> in the public whose addiction to the mirror is itself a symptom of terror. Um, Barker wrote this whole book of, of aphorisms and he was, he, was, he was very interested, let me get back to where we are. Yeah, he was very interested in uh, in, you read in that the one more difference time. in the in the difference between um, between kind of entertainment and and theater. All right, and here's the quote: "The general condition of mankind, fear. In tragedy, the relegation of fear to the perimeters. Hence, the origin of the resentment induced in tragic character by, induced by tragic characters in the public." Hence, the origin of the resentment induced by tragic characters in the public, whose addiction to the mirror is itself a symptom of terror. Whose addiction um, to the mirror, mirror is itself perhaps a symptom of terror. Well, let me um, see. It's, it's even just literally just like rereading it itself is like just to read it. I asked you not because I didn't hear you the first time, but because I wanted. No, no, the I know. To well, repeated. And then let that, me read you. Yes. Let, let me read you the beginning of of um, uh, <clears throat> of of this collection. Um, he says there is the theater and there is the art of theater. All that is proposed in this book pertains to the latter. <laughs> Some have had to do with the art of theater but funding it too arduous chose to join the theater. These are legion, a few remained faithful, very few because it is a painful path. Um, we could go on quoting Barker here, but we, but we won't. Um, Many are the, the, thirsty. the point being that, that for today, all I'm saying in a sense is is the, it, it's very hard, if not impossible, to do serious theater anymore. That's what I'm saying. Institutional theater has banned it. MFA programs have killed it. Um, theater and film overtaken by the entertainment industry uh, have even banished serious film. So I have a suggestion there. Yeah. The suggestion is that we live in a, an anti-theater, an anti-theatrical society. That's not that controversial, right? You know, yeah, yeah. And, but but what I think might be more provocative for some, maybe not to you and Brett, is that we live in an anti-religious society, right? This might be a moment to bring religion back into it. Why is it so difficult to do theater, real theater? Is it because our culture, our society where we find ourselves is so profoundly allergic to the religious? Um, can, I, can I say something? Can I jump in? Please, please, yeah. please. <laughs> um, okay, I, I, would, I would kind of reframe that because you know, going back to theater's origins as a, as a public art, you know, we live under the tyranny of the digital and we're witnessing I think a, a profound anthropological change in the sense that the, the, the social is dying. And, and that is the lifeblood of the theater. Without the social, there can be no, no theater. Um, yeah, and, and I couldn't agree more. And, and we've talked about, <clears throat> about this certainly in, in related ways. And Thomas and I have, we have on the podcast, I've written about it. Um, the digital, the world of screens and apps and smartphones and, and uh, automation and AI and all of it is 
is collectively a process of, of erasing the social. You can pre-order a hotel room, check into the hotel, stay, check out, drive away, and never talk to another human being. This is seen as progress somehow. Uh, and it's not, that's not uh, unrelated to, to this discussion of theater. I think Brett is right that, that a focus on the social and the idea of community <clears throat> is incredibly important here. In Shakespeare's time, people would say, let's go listen to the new play at the Globe. They didn't say, let's go watch the new play. I mentioned this last time. Yeah. That kind of listening is gone too. People, people not only have, are inarticulate and subliterate and don't read, not only, they can't listen to things anymore. That the attention required for serious deep listening to anything is gone. Uh, largely, and, and, and where it exists, probably it, it still exists in some form are in areas of the world furthest removed from the advanced West, from North America and Europe, et cetera. Uh, the Global South is the site of whatever reclamation of theater and art and culture uh, potentially exists will be found there, not, not found in, in the West anymore, sadly. Uh, and this brings us back to, we mentioned writers like Thomas Bernhard, you know, who is a remarkable playwright. He's a great novelist as well. Peter Hunt, Heiner Mueller, those are all the Germans, Franz Xavier Kreutz, uh, uh, Bruno, uh, what's his name, Botho Strauss, uh, there's a whole bunch of them. In England, there was Barker and Tinter, and uh, in the United States, Herbert Blau was the kind of tail end of something after Off Off Brother. And uh, there, the, this, this is a question I ask often, given everything we've just said, and, and we'll return to this because we, we haven't answered this question really of what is an actor. But, the, the question that comes before that is what does society expect or want from the arts anymore? What does contemporary Western society want from culture? What do they think culture is? What's its role? Does it, I don't want to use the word purpose, but, but this, what, what Brett is describing, this erasure of community and the social is certainly a part of whatever answer you come up with to that question. Because I don't know. The fact that the biggest hit film of the year is Barbie should tell us something, you know? I mean... Um, it's, there's, it's, 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 it's very instructive. What occurs to me is how there's increasing emphasis on you know, having whatever is on offer be streamed into your home nobody even wants to go to the movie theater anymore like i will refuse like, to watch a movie streaming that is available in the theater i mean that's just film it's not film not actual theater right but it's just another sort of token of what we're talking about uh this this uh this uh the motion of the importance of space and place and and, and the potential for radical unexpected encounter right you're, you're closing off right so uh, we might go back to that quote right the notion of i'm not certain quite what he means by it because i don't have the total context of the quote but the, 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 the fear is being pushed to the perimeter and thus the resentment fostered by tragic characters in the audience right is, is there something going on there yeah, I, th I think that the people often will comment that tragedy is impossible today and then follow that up by asking why is tragedy impossible? Today? And the answer is complicated and, and it sort of depends what one means by tragedy and that's a whole 
rabbit hole we probably don't have to go into. But but the the real issue is that over the I think since and I've only recently somewhat come to this conclusion that since the advent of the internet, since the the ubiquity of screens in people's lives, the, the compulsive use of smartphones and the necessity of having a smartphone, in fact, if you live in the West, um, is, is a big part of, of the, this kind of crisis of mental health that one sees everywhere. And uh, oddly enough, <clears throat> I was reading Christopher Ryan today, who has a book called Civilized to Death, uh, which, which is a New York Times bestseller, curiously enough, and is not a deep <clears throat> theoretical piece of philosophy or anything, but is, but is reasonably good. And he, he produces a litany of statistics, as others have done, as I have done, about the numbers of people prescribed antidepressants, the rise in suicide, self-harm, domestic abuse, uh, on and on and on, clinical depression, and the falling birth rates. I was reading a statistic about uh, that, that people today are having less sex than they did even 20 years ago. Uh, more people live at home with their parents or economic coercion involved in all of this, obviously. But if you add it all up, it, this is a very unhealthy society and it's not a society that, that is going to produce a lot of audience members for the kind of work that we're talking about. I said at the beginning, this is akin to making buggy whips, being a serious playwright. <clears throat> what do you expect? To get done if, if you take your plays you're a young playwright and you take your plays to an institutional theater one of the big equity houses in new york or los angeles or chicago or baltimore or san francisco uh nobody is going to produce your play until you have submitted to a process of indoctrination dramaturgs will read it and give you notes you will you know sort of engage in uh, a, a sort of several year process of working your way up to the place where you actually get your play read. And then a couple more years, you might get a stage reading. And eventually, if the artistic director deigns to favor you with the production, you will get a hugely mediated and, and uh, boulderized version of whatever you originally thought you were doing, including uh, pen to paper, and wanting to do a play. I have this kind of like strangely pessimistic position about the arts right now. Uh, I think it's very hard, and you just touched on this, Thomas, the, the, the streaming phenomenon, watching a person on your laptop at home alone. Uh, I mean, I've done that. <laughs> it's not the same as being in the theater, but it's not completely worthless either. That, that's not what most people are streaming, though. But this is not what most, <laughs> yeah. But this is most certainly not, not what most people are streaming. And look, uh, there are still things produced in Hollywood, films won every great several years out of the thousands produced, there will be a film of some significance produced. It's, it happens, but it's very rare. And uh, the other problem associated with this is that the last generation of art critics and theater critics and film critics have died off now. They're kind of all gone. Nobody has replaced John Berger or I guess, uh, what's his name is still alive. TJ Clark is still alive, but he's 90 or something. Uh, there's 
we don't even have a Robert Hughes left anymore. There is. I mean, Hughes, Hughes was Hughes was okay, and he wrote for Time Magazine for Christ's sake. Or even Hilton Kramer. Yeah, we don't have anything. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is there's not even that anymore. There's the most puerile, stupid kind of. Uh, I don't even know what to describe it as adverts for or something. It's propaganda. Oh, there's, and there's a problem of lineage here. You're talking about a problem of lineage, of transmission, and that we're entering at, uh, apparently a, 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 a point of perilous discontinuity, right? That is that is what we are seeing here. And of course, that is conceptually consistent given that the digital ultimately is anti-historical. The project yeah. of the digital wants to erase history as an inconvenience, which yeah. may, in fact, bring us back to a remark you had very nigh the outset, John, that it connects to the question of what is it mean? What is you? What does it be? What does it mean to be human? What is it to be a human being? What is human being? And is it possible? that our society is so deeply anti-human that it is going to structurally exclude a fundamental component of that being that is the, the, the sphere of art. And the particularly exiguous circumstances in which theater finds itself exemplify that impasse. Yeah, I mean, look, it, the, the ruling class has done everything it can to kill the audience for serious art. And if you do that, you kill art. Yeah. No, that's you true. kill the audience for it. If you kill that culture, that living culture that you're talking about, John, that existed, I mean, even back in the 80s and 90s, was still, it was on life support, but it was still there. You know, <laughs> you had, you had yeah. Reza Abdo and, and the Wooster group were still doing interesting work, I think, in the 80s and 90s. And, and you have people like Mac, Mac Wellman, who, who's still alive, know, but, I, but, but I, he, he retired, apparently, <laughs> from what yeah. I just read. So, um, I, I know Mac, actually. Yeah. And I knew Reza Abdo, interestingly. Uh, my Reza Abdo story is he was doing a play, some adaptation of a Greek tragedy, <clears throat> in a little tiny black box on the second floor of, 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 I don't know, above a shoe store or something on Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, that was in LA when he was in LA. Yeah, yeah. And, and people had been telling me, you got to see this kid. Uh, he's an Iranian. He's a visionary. He's, no, he's really good. He's very young. Go see it. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm there. Right. So I went, I by myself, I'm, I'm I bought a call. ticket. <clears throat> and we all stood outside this on the ground floor waiting to walk up to the and we kept waiting you know it was like one minute to curtain and and the audience is standing there waiting finally somebody came down so you can come up now so we walked up and it was like thick with smoke chalk smoke and dust and you couldn't see anything and people were coughing a number of people turned around and left and said hey, what the fuck is going on here i'm there you know and i thought okay this is pretty interesting i'm 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 there I walked in and there were only about 15 seats. The audience could only, the house could only hold it, about 15 feet. And chairs were backed up to the wall and I sat down. You couldn't see anything and it was hard to breathe. We were all sitting waiting and the show began. And these people came out of the mist, some of them naked, some not, in this strange adaptation of I think it was a Sophocles play. I don't remember, to be honest, because it didn't matter or no relationship to Sophocles really it was Reza. And it went on. It was very long and strange and incomprehensible. And by the end, of course, the dust had settled and you could see across the room finally and it, and it ended. So on the way out, I was dusting myself off and I asked that I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was a really kind of singular something that I had just seen. And I asked if I could see Rez, who was he there? And he came up and we had a nice conversation. We were friends after that. Um, 
for the, whatever it was the next 10 or 12 years until his death. Uh, but he had the good fortune that, that uh, LA Theater Center adopted him in a sense. And uh, uh, what's his name's wife, who was, who was the guy who ran the LA Theater Center that he later ended up at the Magic Theater. But uh, his wife bankrolled Reza and they did uh, his Eurydice play and a couple of others at the LA Theater Center. And they were great, they were terrific works. And my friend Di Zimmerman has, has written a couple of long essays on Reza. Anyway, that's just my digression about Reza. He was one of the last, yeah, one of the last people engaged in some kind of, some kind of questioning yeah. of, of the medium. And, and understandably, there was very little audience for him. He, he yeah. found a benefactor, but... Uh, well, but, I, I, think it's, I think it's symbolic that both Reza Abdo and Heiner Mueller both died in 95. Yeah. There's something very symbol symbolic about that. Yeah, I mean, the fact that he died in 95, wow. Uh, I saw Reza in New York a few times when, uh, right before my first son was born, I was living in New York and I was eating at this, this macrobiotic restaurant. I would run into Reza there all the time and we'd always sit and talk theater for 45 minutes and, and play company. He was terrific. Uh, and he was very sick by that time, yeah. obviously, as well. This is this is this is ten years before he died. This he was already sick. Uh, so anyway, we're 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 asking these questions though about theater, and I I I want to circle back a little bit to where I began with some of the stuff that Mednick had talked about with the importance of text and so forth, because I think it is important and. It's important in paradoxical ways, probably. Uh, you, I'm a, I'm a, a pretty harsh critic of Robert Wilson, for example, yeah. and it is because he has contempt for the text. He doesn't care about the text, so he puts on a kind of spectacle, and it's not an accident that he's very well funded and. Mm -hmm sells tickets to his rehearsals for great deals of money to watch the great man sit and stare at the spectacle. Yeah, the, the theater of images crowd has done very well. Yeah, and, and not, yeah, not a, not a surprise, right? Yeah. And the interesting thing, I, I have enormous, I had enormous respect for, for Richard Foreman, but the best thing I ever saw Richard Yeah, but he's Foreman, a great writer. I mean, he's a great writer. Yeah, F. Foreman was, was, was brilliant. But the best thing I ever saw Foreman do was at the public theater when he directed a play by Botho Strauss. Mm -hmm. And I have a mental block about the title of this, but I believe it was 1982. You can, I could be wrong about that, but you can look it up. Richard Jordan was the lead in it. And uh, it, Foreman directed it in very straight, when he did it as a Botho Strauss play with none of the ontological hysteria, blah, blah. Yeah, it was for Joe and, Papp at the public theater, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was extraordinary. It's one of the great evenings. I, I went back a second time. I got a ticket and watched it a second time. It was extraordinary, brilliant. And it's when I realized just how great a director Foreman was uh, when I saw him doing this. And it suddenly colored my view of his other work uh, yeah. in, a, in a strange kind of way. But yeah, so the, this stuff this stuff all served as, a, as the kind of addendum footnote postscript to, to off off Broadway and, and Blau and all of these people that we're talking about and England Pinter and, and um, what's his name? Not just Barker, but Howard Brenton and a number of good English playwrights, and England still does some theater that is meaningful and uh, and serious, just because their tradition. They produce terrific actors, and and I've worked in London, and there's always a huge body of, of uh, 
of actors to choose from that are infinitely better than what you find in the United States. But even having said all that, yeah, theater is largely dead because the culture for it is dead. The audience is dead. There are no critics. And it's, it's as if uh, a form, a cultural form is extinct, is going extinct. And, and it will be forgotten what, what the actual uh, tangible feeling of theater will, will be forgotten soon. In another 20 years, <clears throat> I don't think anybody will even remember what, what actual theater yeah. is. Um, because it just, it's, it's, it's the absolute opposite of what this culture demands now in, in terms of entertainment and distraction. Yeah, I, I, I think theater, I mean, theater's under attack. It's under, it's under attack on both of its flanks and frontally. So frontally, you have this frontal assault of the digital, okay? And then on one flank, it's being attacked by what I call the unholy trinity of grant writing, uh, regional nonprofit theater, uh, MFA industrial complex on one flank, you know, the, the last vestiges of this, this, this watered down kind of naturalistic, you know, journalistic kind of theater. Um, and on the other flank, it's being attacked by the, the kind of, the kind of anti-theater prejudice, uh, you know, with performance art, e.g., you know, uh, Marina Abramovich oh and, yeah. and Wilson and the theater of images crowd. So it's being attacked on both its flanks and it's a frontal assault, too. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's not good. Not good. No. And and performance art. I mean, um, Marina Abramovich, we could spend a great deal of time talking about how do we want to waste time on that? I don't know. Yeah, how destructive, <laughs> how destructive her influence actually is. But but performance art had a window of... So wait, maybe it's actually worthwhile to talk a little bit about that, even if briefly, okay. on the destructiveness of her influence. Why, why is it possible? Here's the question. Why is it possible for her to have that kind of destructive effect? What are the conditions of possibility that make that uh, such? Well, it's not really her person. It's what she represents. I'm just kind of, she's yeah. just a kind of symbolic figure of, of this kind of anti-theatrical prejudice. Uh, and she's well-funded. She's, she's politically and financially well-connected because her art, well, it's not art, it's, it's, it's kitsch. And her her per, her purveyance of kitsch, uh, it it's it works for the system. Yeah, I mean, and that and that introduces something else we should we should touch upon. Uh, kitsch. The evolution. I have said in the past that that on one level anyway, the last sincere art in in the United States maybe anywhere, but let's say in the US and Europe was abstract expressionism. And it following on the footsteps of the New York school came the ascension of irony and kitsch and camp, which very quickly was subsumed by this other uh, assemblage of, of values that, that uh, I associate with uh, the, the, the cultural industry with entertainment and, and distraction and so forth. But the rise of irony and the snarkiness and lack of sincerity that it became somehow very hard because the society itself was losing a sense of sincerity and, and they, people would laugh at you if you suggested the role of art had a moral component to it, that, that it was <clears throat> something of a serious endeavor. I always think of Pablo and Ruda's comments about this, but um, it, 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 you look at during the 
Vietnam War, the protests against Vietnam War, poets like Bly and, and Galway Cannell and Allen Ginsberg and on and on, a bunch of people, Robert Lowell even, went around doing poetry readings against the war. And they were very political, um, but the work wasn't oddly enough polemical at all particularly, it was interesting. That to, has, those artists, all of them instinctually anti-state, anti-authoritarian, anti-imperialist, just instinctively, reflexively so, that now we see artists uh, holding free concerts in support of Ukraine and of NATO. And uh, we could give a dozen examples of the, the you know, artists insisting people wear COVID masks to their concerts. You have to have proof of vaccination to get in to see whoever it was, some rock band, you know, Patti Smith, all of these people. So, so mainstream, the, the, the alternative culture, the counterculture from the 60s and then through the 70s leading into the 80s was, was drying up and being replaced with uh, uh, careerist practitioners of, of what were, were really pro-US imperialist values. That's what was happening. And, and it's absolute today. And we could then talk about the role of censorship in all of this too, because, uh, because if you hold the wrong opinion today, it's already, if you're a theater artist, it's virtually impossible to get produced anyway. But if you hold the wrong political opinion, you absolutely are guaranteed not to get produced or heard from or seen or anything else. And this situation is getting worse all the time, I think. And uh, <clears throat> this is another guarantee of killing culture. You know. hmm. Yeah, oh, it's okay. certainly I hear been intensified over the past three years as well. Um, yeah, it, 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 Plague, this is but not the plague that they talk about, right? The contagion, but not the contagion they talk about is a force. And the censorship of which you speak is a premier uh, symptom of that plague, of that contagion. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the, I remember when Han Ki won the Nobel Prize, and it's a kind of miracle, a strange reality <clears throat> that he actually won the Nobel Prize. Not that the Nobel Prize has a great deal of meaning, but still, uh, it was interesting that he won it, but there were massive protests uh, against awarding him the Nobel Prize because he had taken a stand against the destruction of Yugoslavia and then defense of Milosevic and all of these things. So he was anathema to um, legacy media, corporate media, he, he, he was erased and, and all of the people I'm talking about, I mean, Thomas Bernhardt or, or whoever, uh, Heiner Mueller are, are except in small pockets, uh, uh, little cultural outposts, they're largely invisible. Part of the official narrative is, is to disappear these people and it's been very effective. And, uh, and, and it's something that on, <clears throat> on one level, I feel everybody should know by this point, this is obvious. So I want to go back though, before we get derailed into these, these topics. And yes, so, yeah. But, but this, this question of what is theater, what is an actor is, is important. And listening to Brett and, and you and having this, this dialogue today, I'm, I'm reminded of, of both Grotowski, but even more Cantor and his company in, in, um, in Krakow. And I lived in Krakow for a number of years uh, before I actually was officially at the film school. But 
what Cantor was doing required a company of actors that today would be very hard to find. The level of commitment and sacrifice required to do that kind of work because that he'd rehearse in one sense <clears throat> work for 20 years. It, it, it was a never ending process, right? Yeah, but the, the Soviet you, Union made that possible. I mean, it was the Soviet Union that made that, that possible for, yeah. for all of its flaws. It, that's what enabled him to do that work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is an important point. And, uh, and, and so it, when I was the last years I was doing plays in Los Angeles, it became increasingly hard to, and I was working, I, there was usually three or four actors that were long time collaborators with me. That was fine. But for the other parts and, and, and finding stage managers and lighting technicians and all of the rest, uh, it, was, it was increasingly difficult because people simply weren't going to put in the kind of time and effort for no money, really, uh, and, and for a project that was not going to get great visibility, probably, that you were going to have to struggle and fight to get audiences in every night. Uh, and, and the last play I did, Phantom Luck, which won LA Weekly Play of the Year and got rave reviews, and you can look it up and read the reviews, was a you know, terrific production before that, about six, seven years before that, we did Dogma. <clears throat> These were incredibly well-received plays, but it was an ordeal to get them put on. I mean, it was an ordeal. And it cost me money. I didn't make money. It cost me money. And by the time we did Phantom Luck, I, I left um, not long after that. And I thought, this is, this is, I can't do this anymore. This is not fun. And, and it's just too hard. If it, it, and it's starting to feel impossible, in fact, not just hard. It's, it's, I was defeated in that sense because everything is against you and the, the appreciation you get is, is, is pretty limited. There are the, the last remnants of, of theater goers, people who believe in the theater would come, but that was about it. And they were mostly getting old by this time. Uh, and I thought this is, this is just masochistic. One can't do this anymore. So uh, I did do this Lear in Poland, but that was, that was, I think, a total of three performances for, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred people. The Polish actor Marian Opania was one of the leaders. He's a great actor. He's a very well-known Polish actor. It didn't matter. This stuff was, was too strange. And, and we did it in Woods, which wasn't Warsaw. So it, the point being that <clears throat> we are talking about what, what Cantor did and the kind of company he could put together and and but even in a kind of bastardized fashion, what Krakowski did, uh, uh, and, and there are others, there are companies in Chile and all over the world, that, but, but this, the, the, this, the, the apparatus of, of propaganda is against them and they aren't going to be known about or talked about. And there is no alternative press. There are no critics to champion these people, to talk about these people wherever they might be. And there's, I'm sure many I don't know about, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you mentioned Mac Wellman recently and, and yeah, Mac ended up teaching, I think with some ambivalence and, and yeah, is it retired? I don't know how old Mac is, but but these were the last stragglers from from the post post off off Broadway movement. And and if you, I don't. There's a yeah. there's a actually I ran across this the other day. It was an interview in Brooklyn Rail Magazine, John, from mm -hmm. March of 2020, right right before the uh, 
the 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 uh, the coup psychosis began, and it was an interview with Mac Wellman. Um, and it's a very it's an interesting interview, but it's very depressing. But you might want to go and, and read it. Oh, so, I'd love to read it. Yeah. 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 And that's when he said he's basically retiring because he was he he, he was done. He couldn't he couldn't get the work produced anymore, basically. So. Yeah. Well, he came to see opening night when I did the last sort of, I guess it was the last play I did at all in New York, which was Sea of Cortez. We had done it in Los Angeles and we did yeah. it in New York. <clears throat> he came opening night and I saw him afterwards and came up. He goes, it's just, yeah, it's just terrific. Boy, they're going to hate you, though. Yeah. <laughs> I, I said, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that. He said, uh, and you're opening the same week as uh, uh, Angels in America. You know, that was a really smart decision. I said, well, it was out of my hands. He said, but you understand that what you just put on the Sea of Cortez doesn't pander to the audience <laughs> at all. And Angels in America, for all its virtues, does nothing but pander to the audience. And I said, yeah, and so they're going to get all the press and, and we won't. And we did. Um, and we got, I don't know, kind of lukewarm reviews or something. We were, we were um, damned with faint praise. And, and it was a great production. You know, it was, I was very happy with that production. But, but that was the last time I saw Mac. He was already uh, remarkably cynical and, uh, and saddened by things. So, uh, so let me ask you. Yeah. You wanted to get back to the original question. Of I, do. I do. What is theater? So maybe you could. Yeah. Let me. Let me. Let me that. talk about that for a second. Uh, I I started off by saying that I think religion comes out of the, that that theater is the most basic expression. At its, at its origins, at its core, it is the most basic expression of the human, of human self-awareness, for lack of a better way to put it. And, and there, is, there is this idea that Freud had, and he only referenced it once or twice, Lacan jumped on it and became very obsessed with it for better or worse, <clears throat> Freud called it Das Ding, the thing. And, and it came up in uh, a paper, as I recall, in which Freud was, was suggesting something uh, related to Jungian collective unconscious, which officially he rejected. But he said, there is this thing, this thing, this archaic, primordial trace of something from our past that that is not conscious that is not our own memory it but it's there and Lacan talked about that that thing that spark that inexplicable I mean and, and theologians will tell you it's God uh, that that the turning away from that the retreat from from this thing that we can't talk about or describe was the was the beginning of reason was the beginning of rationality anyway and and that and I, god knows i don't want to reference heidegger the metaphysical nazi but 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 this was actually Heidegger's position, and even Adorno was perilously close to this, in a sense, that, that, that that's, that spark, that thing is also related to, because we're talking like a collective species-like <clears throat> trace of something, on an individual level, and this is what becomes very interesting to me, on an individual level, this is the pre-linguistic place of 
Uh, childhood amnesia. What, what is childhood amnesia? It is, it, it is somehow the introduction into language is part of this, this turning away from uh, uh, what, what is the actual awareness of, of, our, of our existence and that consequently, as life goes on, we, we, we retreat further and further from this. Now, last night on the podcast, I, I, let me, I'm, God, I'm going to so find my glasses. Never... Let me read you, let me read you something. I'm just going right. to run over you for one second because no, you're good. I, 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 I read this last night and I'm going to read it again um, because maybe it explains, because I was, um, it's a paragraph, so bear with me. No, you're fine. The modern individual for Marx coincided with the rise of markets in which the owners of commodities were able to exchange their commodities, the qualities of, for quantities of the general equivalent. Modern subjectivity is deeply wedded to this emergence, but the idea of human psychic evolution is complex. Children like to often go off by themselves and climb trees or explore terrain unfamiliar to them. City kids do their own version of this only in abandoned buildings, etc. And younger children will often find a place, sometimes in a tree or in a grotto, where they themselves feel they can't be seen. And in their silence, they daydream. This is a familiar experience from everyone's childhood, I think, everyone. Now, these younger children have less developed vocabularies. They cannot articulate what they feel. And again, childhood amnesia looms as a profound riddle. But older children <clears throat> may have enough of a vocabulary to explain or describe what they felt alone in that tree. But it is always but a very partial description. For that sense of freedom, of aloneness, and usually quiet, is the other part of religious experience. I have said before that religion comes out of theater, not the other way around. But that is partial to, or this, this aspect of taking oneself away from the world has deep roots that probably go back to the early hunter-gatherer communities. For the child brings that experience back to the home or community silently as men return from war often silently with a different and traumatic experience. Victims of violence bring that experience back to the home or society and there are no words for this. And it is exactly because there are no words that it has such deep resonance. Is it possible that this unworded resonance is a deeper form of memory? or rather another register of memory, the prehistory of the child in a sense. Childhood amnesia is actually another kind of remembering." Um, close quote. Now, for me, this is related to, to an answer of what is theater. That, that the origins of theater have are related to seeing and being seen, not being seen when you're little or as an adult, that, that, that suddenly a stage exists in the community in which people are watching a member of the community who de facto then is an actor and somebody else and they begin talking. This is somehow related, in, you know, and it's very hard to talk about, is related to what Freud was talking about, this, or, or religious, you know, Thomas will call the, the God, the ecstatic, the sublime, 
that is there in a, but a fleeting impermanent momentary glance somehow a trace that we carry with us back to our community somehow from childhood or not from trauma or not and if you believe in freud it is in a symbolic um, way the site of the primal trauma okay how's that for a extraordinarily long answer <laughs> well, I have thoughts about that response. Um, I, in a sense, it's almost uh, in hearing it and receiving it uh, indifferent that you allude to Freud. Because what Freud is, 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 as I understand it, talking about is something which is sort of built into the structure of human experience. It could have been said by Freud, it could have been said by any human being and has been said by many human beings that there is this uh, ground this space this domain I, i'm putting in mind in some respects i think uh, eastern traditions might talk about it more effectively than western right uh, right you're talking about a moment of kensho if you like to be sort of uh, shamelessly zen about this flash of something which is wordless which seems a ground uh, that exposes us to our and now I'm going to go back to sort of a more western way of talking about it, uh, our radical contingency and yeah. um this is actually you know, maybe practically at the heart of relationship is, is the sharing of that we are all radically contingent. And the theater no. is disclosing this common vulnerability. And, that's and very good, yeah. That, that, is, that is sort of how I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I get a little hesitant personally in appealing to psychoanalytic discourses. They have their worth, but sometimes they are treading a line that can be you know, over which one can trip and fall into the kind of madness of psychiatry, which is at the heart. Uh, well, and, and yeah, I let me. I don't want to go off. That's that's a whole other song and dance. Yeah, and, yeah. and 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 but, I will. Uh, only, uh, uh, yeah, let's not. I'll come back to that. But I want to. I want to answer some because I think the word disclosing is a really very good word. It's what Benjamin. Um, talked about with tragedy. The tragedy was, I said, revealing, but it's actually a disclosing of something, right? And and it's related to mortality, as is everything, I suppose. Uh, uh, I I think I I had an anecdotal story that I always found funny but very meaningful. Uh, no theater company was touring and appeared in New York and they were doing one of the classic Japanese no plays. And if you've ever watched no theater, it is unbelievably slow. I mean, it's like watching paint dry. It's, it's unbelievably slow. So I was there with my girlfriend's family at the time, we bought the tickets and we were watching. The lights come up and an actor sitting there, somebody else sitting there. And they don't move for like two minutes, literally. It's an eternity on stage. And finally, the one character turns. <laughs> he doesn't say anything. And my girlfriend's dad said, ah, the plot thickens. <laughs> and I always thought this was a really funny remark, but, uh, but he, but, but there was a deep truth in that. And I thought, so what are they doing? Um, because it's about 
it's a, it's about silence. It's about listening. It's about this deep attention you're being forced to to uh, engage in. This it, it's almost being extracted. So it only happens on stage, and. And it has enormous, I mean, I, that performance, by the way, was brilliant and, and upsetting uh, because I think arts and forms, art forms, Adorno again, form uh, that is radical in some sense, whatever it is, if you just throw away uh, any sort of hierarchy of value attached to it. it's good, it's bad, it's indifferent, it's just, but it just recognizes it's happening, you're engaged with it. Those kind of radical forms are always going to be upsetting, or disruptive, whatever word you want to use, on some level. And that is a level that I think probably everyone would agree is has been colonized by marketing and advertising and media and so forth. Uh, that's exactly what one is not allowed to, to practice because, because it's bad for business, if nothing else. I mean, you know, you go see a Japanese no play, you don't leave the theater wanting to buy new Nike sneakers. If you go to a film of Wells Othello, you do not want to go by Nike Theater. If you leave Barbie, I'm guessing, I haven't seen Barbie, I'm guessing you might well want to go shopping at the mall. You know, this is this is facile commentary, but but there is a truth in it. So um, so what theater is, all the ways we're talking about it and circling around it is because it's extraordinarily difficult to pin down and and this goes back to my idea of the offstage as the unconscious, that it is the unseen, on some level, the unknowable, that is so profoundly attractive and terrifying at the same time, I think. Uh, and, and to me, yeah. I would. Yeah, it, I mean, yeah. theater. Go ahead. Yeah, theater. Oh, I mean, ahead. theater to me fundamentally is about death. And that speaks to the fundamental paradox of theater, which is it's an ephemeral art. It takes place in a certain place at a certain time and it vanishes. But in that vanishing, it leaves traces of the eternal. That's when great. it works, That's when great. it works. Yeah, yeah. That's a beautiful description. Yeah, yeah. Um, and our, our, our society is pathologically terrified of death and themes of death and yeah uh, yeah no and and this this boy see this relates to an answer we could give for what is an actor yeah i mean an, an actor is the, the emissary from beyond the grave yes, an yes. actor is sure, is sure. That yeah, liminal I boundary mean, space, yes. Yeah, yeah. And and so, so, and this is, I mean, it was one of the truths amid all the madness that Artaud grasped. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Artaud said a very curious thing at one point. It doesn't, because, you know, Artaud was terribly confused and mad and stuff, but he, but he also, he also, intuited something very profound about theater but he said when an actor is on stage and the lights come up i'm paraphrasing the lights come up and the actor forgets all of his lines that goes up as we say in theater and stands stark naked in terror because he can't remember his lines that he is more himself than he has ever been as a person Okay, that's an Artoian observation, but but it 
it is related to some kind of truth about what actors do that performance live in front of the 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 both the impermanence as you say the fact that it can't be repeated the fact that accidents happen that it is that it is dangerous because it is not mechanically reproduced it is simply a moment of something dangerous psychically socially dangerous what that is is very difficult and different artists whether it's Mueller or Brecht or have different ideas about what that is Genet. uh and and i find this pinter of talk about pinter for a second pinter it, for Pinter, it was language. It was the unsaid. It was the language of the offstage. It's what, I don't know if he would agree with that even. It's, but it's what's it, happening between the words. Well, between the words, between the words. Yeah. yeah, and it's what, I mean, Pinter's scenes began in very interesting places uh, and they end in very interesting places. Uh, but, but, to answer the way back, we were talking about why is it two characters are required for theater? And I think one part of the answer is because a single character cannot ask a question of, except by turning to the audience and then it's not theater anymore. Then it's a, a lecture or a, a, a sermon or something. And this was always my problem with, with a lot of performance art and monologue is because it just seemed narcissistic. And because what, what interests me <clears throat> is that moment when one actor looks at another actor, says something to another actor, when a second actor enters from off stage and they look at each other. I, to this day, I love this. Every time I go to the theater, it doesn't matter how bad the play is, that moment holds some significance, no matter what follows it and how bad what follows it might be. Uh, it, it's, it's the question. The second character begs a question, an interrogation, uh, and it's, I, I used to give dialogue, uh, I'm repeating myself, I used to give dialogue <clears throat> exercises. And the example I gave was one character, first character sitting at a table, second character enters and says to the first character, I'm hungry, do you have a banana? And the second, the first character at the table says, no, why would I have a banana? Second character leaves. Okay, bad version. Second version, character comes in and says, hey, uh, I'm hungry. Do you have a banana? The guy at the table turns and looks at him and doesn't answer. Pause. The questioner walks out. Okay, that's a better version because there was a question asked and there was no answer. So there's a tension. Then suddenly the third version is the character walks in. The guy at the table looks at him and says, I don't have any bananas. Why would I have a fucking banana? And the first guy doesn't say anything and leaves. This is the best version because there's an answer to an unasked question. So there's now like a double or tripling of the unknown. This was just a writing exercise. And I've, I've given this about a thousand times in my life. But, but it's very relevant in a sense because, because this idea of the interrogation is is replicated, is mirrored in police interrogations. I'm fascinated by the figure of the man in the glass booth because Hollywood, there's been 10 films with characters in glass, being prisoned in glass booths that hold some strange symbolic resonance for uh, the unconscious of Hollywood. Uh, this idea of is, is related to authority, to to the questioner, to the detainee, to the exile, all of these things to me are very related to theater. I mean, Adorno talked about 
Odysseus is this exile. He was obsessed, given being, he was an exile himself, with, with the figure of the exile. And, uh, and you see it in Kafka, both Benjamin and Adorno saw Kafka as being very theatrical, that he was writing plays in a sense. You look at the trial, you know, this is like a Beckett play in a sense. Uh, because that space, that space is, is pregnant with these unspoken questions and interrogations and non-answers and answers in the MC. Kafka is, is the great writer of an offstage in, in prose. Anyway, I'm going on here, but, but the point being that I think what you say about um, about character actors and and the the relationship they have to the other actor on stage is the kernel of something very mysterious that gets disappeared in uh, often almost always in film and we could talk about why some films manage to do it and some don't but and it certainly in entertainment, in popular culture, in the rise of the ironic that we reference, all of this is working diametrically to, to dilute that tension that is, I think, very fundamental and, and uh, uh, well, profoundly it strikes that, me who, that, at the uh, origins of the stage. Yeah. What? Well, I mean, it is interesting, this moment that you point out on stage when the actors encounter, they encounter each other, and it connects to something you said earlier, that an actor is always also acting themselves, right? It's not just the character, right? I think the reason that that moment has a potency on stage and not in film is because in that encounter, they're both like, just like you were saying that remark to Roteau, like when the single actor comes out of stage and forgets his line, he is himself, you know, in a new deeper way. But then that same thing is happening when the two actors encounter each other, right? Yeah. They're then themselves. Now, on the stage, on the stage, you have the gravitas of, of, of the actor, of the presence of the actor and, and the body and, and the voice and that, the surprise of that encounter, and it's an enfleshed encounter. It's it's yeah. You know, it's not it's it's not virtual. It's real. It's there. Uh, anyway. I'm, yes. Yeah. No. And I <laughs> yeah. allow me to say one more thing. We're, yeah. we're going on at great length, but no, those are new great observation. I mean, or a, a great way to put it. But there's something else. If you have ever acted, you understand. I think. And I've done very little, but I've, I've appeared in several plays by friends and Irene Fornestra. And this, and I'm not an actor, but I know enough that I got up there and I, and I went through the motions and I did it. And I understood the seductive nature of acting. That connection with the other actor, when you look into their eyes and they're giving you something and you're giving them something, whatever that is, is illicit and it's secret and uh and it exists nowhere else this is back to yan cot and 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 the mad tom scene in in lear it, it it can happen nowhere else this furtive illicit connection uh i think it's why so many actors end up having affairs with their co-stars actually because it's it's erotic it's it's dangerous and strange and it happens nowhere else and it's unspoken and you get as an actor to enter this space that exists nowhere else in the world in reality it's it's a magical kind of uh um <clears throat> secret, yeah, let me, let me... <laughs> secret space that only exists in that moment as you say it's real but it's but it's unseen on one level but seen yeah. by everyone on another level go ahead 
Yeah, I was just going to read. It's, it's just a brief quote. Um, and uh, well, here, here it is. The, the actor must see before describing, hear before answering, and feel before trying to express himself. That's uh, Charles Delan, who was a, he was a protege of Jacques Capot uh, and French avant-garde theater in the 20s and 30s. Yeah. yeah. No, but see, that's great. That's great. And <clears throat> I, I, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily hard to, to, to have conversations about these things because I could sit down and try to write at length. I mean, I read you that piece, which I read the very same paragraph last night on the podcast, because it keeps circling around for me, this idea of early childhood art, in this case, the theater, almost always for me, the theater, death, maybe because I'm getting older, uh, a good, not a good friend, but a guy I worked with and admired and was friends with, Mark Margolis, great actor, died last night, two nights ago. And so I'm suddenly feeling like, well, see, this is, so this is the stuff that is what theater is about. And, and all of it, one has to struggle to, uh, to, to reach anymore, what's the word I'm looking for? To activate this stuff, this ephemeral, odd, undefined cloud of unknowing that's out there on stage in, in, in the theater dynamic or is off stage, to, to access it is ever more difficult. And, yeah. and I think that's part of on an unconscious level, why so many people are feeling increasingly depressed and, and confused and hopeless. Uh, because we as human beings need that, the way children need to go escape and be alone and unseen, humans, I think, need the stage. And they're not- Well, we need, we need each other, anymore. we need each other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, and that's what theater does. That's what theater does. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a great point. That's that's sort of the end of of of, of this arc of, of this discussion in a sense is yeah, we need the stage. Humanity needs the stage. The individual needs the stage. Whatever you, theater performance, the ritual of accessing this illicit, private, dangerous moment, both seen and unseen, all these things we're talking about are required to keep from going crazy, I think. Yeah, and I think this is sort of maybe a, a good moment in which to sort of just adjourn. Uh, because what you're saying, both of you, were, uh, throws into light the tragedy of the loss of theater, the loss of this stage of the society, because for it to actually work, it does have to be enfleshed and incarnate. Like you were saying, it's difficult to discuss these things because what's happening is actually at the very edge of what can be uttered. It's, it's, it, can, it can only be realized by involving yourself in it. You can only learn to ride a bicycle by riding the bicycle, right? So that's a, 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 an instance of lower dignity of the species, same basic problem. So insofar as we are losing the theater in our society, we are losing access to a part of what it is to be human. And that, yeah. that's really yeah. part of the, 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 the tragedy and even the crime of, of our contemporary. I mean, theater, theater is that in that coming together uh, and having that experience, um, uh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you just. <laughs> oh, you, well, I'm a, I had yeah, something I'm, good to I'm, say, but now I, I'm. I'm. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it was brilliant. Um, no, I will just kind of conclude with 
with because I, I I get where you're going and it's what we're all kind of pointing towards something here. Uh, because Tom wait a minute, I have it. I have it. I have okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go. 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 I was just going to say that that experience of the theater and that coming uh, together is an experience unmediated through the technology of the spectacle. Yeah. And yeah. theater is one of the last That's spaces true. for that, that that experience to happen. Yeah. So, anyway, it's, no, on. it's the it's it's like it's like the medium that is there's no app for theater. Yeah. Right? There's <laughs> the, you you can't you can't it's that you can't that, fake it. You can't fake no, it. No, and 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 I think that uh, going back to that Wittgenstein quote about private language, not only you know you learn to ride a bike, you learn to know that what you're feeling is pain as a child. It, it, you have to, everything is shared. All, all the process of learning is, is, is shared language, is the learning of a language that, that is part of a tradition and a heritage and a history, which is also all being eradicated. This war on farms, on small farms, is not just a war on food. It's a war on community and tradition and history. It's, a, it's killing off an entire way of life and, and learning and knowledge. Anyway, let's not go down that. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> we can pick that up again. I'm toast here, but uh, um, yeah, I, I, think uh, I think it. I think it's safe to say uh, that war was declared in in March of 2020 on what yeah. it is to be human. So that's yeah. yeah I would co-sign that entirely. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it is a war. It's a war. I, I was talking with Fred about this a few days ago. I like, sort of a personal experience of just how. insulting uh, roboticization is. And I'm putting it rather rather diplomatically, right? Yeah. Um, but the drive to automation is a whole other topic, but it's, it's, it, it is anti-human, it is anti-human. We are destroying, we are destroying our, our lives. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, and I, you know, up. I have, I have young children, and I, this is what concern, you know, I think about what, you know, I, I have an older son, of course, in his forties in Los Angeles, but, but these, the young boys that I had very late, you know, I, my wife had it, but for me, very late. Uh, uh, I think what, what is the world they're going to be led into in ten more years? Uh, it won't be, it won't be the world, the, the kind of world that I experienced at the age of 16 or 17 or 18 when they're reaching you some kind of experience. Of and it's terrifying to think what it might be, you know. Anyway, okay. I, I hate to be abrupt, but we are going on, I think, over two yeah. hours. No, yeah. I know. I can't. I'm done. I'm toast. Um, so... Well, we but it was a pleasure, Brett, to meet you, and I hope we can talk again. And, and we and should all go to Thank you, Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, I've been I've been reading your work for a long time, so. Oh well, thanks. Uh, Thank you. I actually no, I introduced I introduced Tom to your work. So. Oh well. Okay. Well, send me an email or something. We'll we can we can correspond some more, and okay. Tom and I are in touch. So. Right. We, Thank uh, you both. Maybe we can take up this question of the, the experience of childhood next time and how it's been transfigured. Hey. Yeah. All yeah, right. I'm, wor I'm working on a new blog post about education and childhood, actually, because uh, I think it's quite critical. Maybe because my kids are starting school now, first grade, and I think, you know, it, I shudder. Well, and I'm, I'm in Norway, which is relatively same yeah so all right guys thank you guys later on so thank you john very much thank you john yeah my pleasure thanks guys Ciao. Bye.